Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the day two of Faculty Academy 2009. Welcome back to those of you who were here yesterday and lived to tell the tale. Yesterday, we saw a wonderful presentation on openness in higher education from Dr. James Boyle. We saw a wonderful look at emerging trends in scholarship and student, uh, student work from Cole Camplees. And I'm sad to say, we witnessed the tragic Sinclairing of Jim Groom. <laughs> <laughs> and so we're ready to start with the good stuff today. We'll begin with uh, Dr. Laura Blankenship. She is currently the, the founder and president of Emerging Technologies Consulting. She is also the geekiest mom that I know. <laughs> and Prior to that position, she was at Bryn Mawr as an instructional technology specialist where she did, well, everything, pretty much. So please join me in welcoming Laura Blankenship. Okay, I'm short, so thanks, Patrick, and thanks to um, Martha and everyone at University of Mary Washington for having me down here. I'm really delighted to be here. Um, this is my third year at Faculty Academy. Um, I found out about it from Gardner's blog. So I was reading all this buzz about it and I said, you know what, I don't live that far away. I'm only three hours away. I'm gonna drive down here and see what this is all about. And so I've been coming for the last three years and it's just been a wonderful experience all those years. So. Um, when Martha called me and told, wanted me to come give a presentation, she said, you can do whatever you want. So that's a warning. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, okay, all those weird things that are bouncing around in my head, I can actually talk about them? Great. So that's what I'm going to do today. And another warning, I'm also using brand new technology. So um, unlike James Boyle, I uh, do tend to use a lot of technology. So. This is what my presentation looks like, zoomed out. This is Prezi. Um, it's a series of circles that are interconnected, so hopefully it will be interconnected for you as well. So let me get to the first slide. Um, and I've already messed up. Hold on one moment. <laughs> we will get there. There we go. Okay. So um, I titled this, Any Moron Can Write a Blog, or I kind of retitled it, If Any Moron Can Write a Blog, then we're all blogs, all morons, right? Um, so uh, the thing about this, somebody actually said this to me. So, um, you know, this, I was talking about blogs at a conference, and they said, well, you know, aren't the people behind those, these crazy pajama-clad um, idiots, uh, why would I do anything like that? And so I started thinking about that because no one had said anything like that to me so directly, but I'd heard these complaints about blogs for many, many years. Um, and I'd written my dissertation about how blogs can be so useful to students. So I was like, what is behind this? And I thought, you know, it's really kind of an easy way out to say that the people who write blogs are not up to our standards. Um, so I tried to figure out what was behind that and think about it. So that's. Um, where this presentation came from. And I actually consider this to be, I said it's a conversation, not a presentation. I consider this to be an ongoing conversation because I think it's also too easy to polarize it the other way and to say that, well, you have to use blogs. They're great, they're fabulous. Why aren't you using them? So I wanna avoid that polarization. So I invite you to interrupt me, to ask questions. Um, I don't care if I get to the last circle, it's fine. So feel free to stop. Yes, I'm short, so I'll get there. All right, so I have a confession. Hi, I has a blog. <laughs> I've had a blog for five years. Um, I do sometimes blog in my pajamas. And I actually really like my blog and found it useful, so my students have a blog. And they've had a blog for mm, three, four years. I've been using them. And I bet some of you have blogs, too. So, are we morons? Well, maybe. Like I said, I'm, I do wear my pajamas. 
But I think this is um, too easy, as I said before. So the response to this fear that the people behind the blogs are morons or not up to our standards, they lack authority, is to send our students to the library. Just use the library, please. Um, and the, that's, you know, a legitimate response. But it's time for us to get a little bit real about what our students really do. And Cole got to some of these yesterday. So um, we need to learn how our students are really searching, what they're really finding, what they're doing with that information, and we need to help them in that process. So everything that I've looked at lately says that only 10% of our students start a search at the library. That means that 90% of them are starting somewhere else. Where are they going? Google. Why do they go to Google? Well, it's easy, of course. But Google also indexes a trillion web pages. Surely you'll find something that's useful in those trillion pages. The idea being that if you throw darts at it, eventually you'll hit something. Um, it's actually fairly unlikely they'll find something useful, right? Um, it's actually unlikely they'll even find something as unuseful as a blog. Only about 0.01% of all of those pages are blogs. So we don't need to worry about that. 0.003% of that are peer-reviewed articles. And most of those are unavailable. You might find the site, but not the actual article. Um, Technorati puts out a report every um, year. Um, Cole was complaining yesterday that they're not quite as up-to-date as they could be. But they have said, you know, we've been tracking blogs now for the last, you know, five, six years. Um, and the lines between what is a blog and what's a mainstream media site have really blurred. I mean, all the political campaign websites were built on blog software, made heavy use of blogs. Sometimes the front page was a blog. So you don't always know what's what. And increasingly, and this is a good thing, the wall between the closed web, where all of those peer-reviewed articles are located, and the open web, where all of those crazy blogs are located, is coming down. So how do we start to sort through this mess of information? when everything looks exactly the same. A blog, a media site, a peer-reviewed article, a professor's website, they all are starting to blur together. Our students have actually developed some strategies. They go to Amazon. Skip Google, go to Amazon. So a couple of, well, maybe three or four weeks ago, I had a student in my office who was writing a paper on um, the women's labor movement and its relationship to the Industrial Revolution. Well, I'm an English professor. I know nothing about the labor movement, the Industrial Revolution, any of those things. So I asked her, well, where have you gone to look for information? Let me see if I can help you find what you're looking for. She said, well, let me show you what I found on Amazon. It's like, that's like going to Walmart to go get your book for your research paper. Who does that? Apparently she does it. And why did she do it? Well, for, first of all, the search is actually easier than going to the library. Secondly, she can find out a lot more information about the books that she might use from Amazon. She can see the table of contents. She can see chapter examples. She can practically read the whole book right there on Amazon.com. And if she has a Kindle, she can download it. So she was getting a lot more information about every particular source. She could also get a list of other recommendations. So she started to build a picture of what this you know, topic that she was exploring was looking like. And then you know, I directed her back to the library. But that's where many of our students are starting. The other place they go, of course, is Wikipedia. And they're actually quite smart about their use of Wikipedia. How many of you use Wikipedia as a starting place? OK, we're all using it. <laughs> it's the dirty little secret. Um, <laughs> they, of course, have gotten smart enough not to use it as a source. We're no longer are having that argument. Um, but if you don't know anything about a topic, that's where you start out. 
Um, and a lot of times they end up using those citations at the end or they learn what keywords to use. So it's a really good starting place for them. Now we all know that Google and Wikipedia and Amazon don't have all the answers. But not everything is in the library either. How many of you have had the experience of running into this, zero results, or finding the article that you need but is not currently available? Now, if you're a faculty member or a librarian, you know about interlibrary loan. You plan in advance so that you can use interlibrary loan. Most of our students don't do that all the time. So I want to talk about how social software and its principles can help teach our students about evaluating information outside of the library and inside the library as well. So for me, and I was saying this yesterday when I was talking in my workshop about um, creating a personal learning network, social software is about the connections, primarily connections between people, but it's also connections to making, building real connections to research, to people, to you know, material that's out there on the web. Um, so we need to help our students create those um, connections. And when you think about it, that's what we do as scholars. We build connections. We build on other people's work. We build relationships with people. And we make these connections that we then use in our work. Well, we need to help our students build those same connections. And of course, I broke something. Sorry. Fast through the... You are now seeing the limitations of this tool. Here we go. There. And I also want to talk about transparency, which you just got to see. <laughs> um, so one of the things that um, I sort of run into when I talk to students a lot is that they don't really understand why you need to use a peer-reviewed uh, um, material or a book as opposed to the blog that they read um, or you know the what seems like valuable information on other websites and it's not a very transparent process to them heck it's not a transparent process to most of us um, it just seems like a big mystery and social software though it's not perfect about this actually um, you know, tries to be as transparent as, as it can be um, through blog comments, through the history on wikis, through just any kind of, you no longer have to take anybody's word for anything. You can write a blog post about it. You can leave a comment. You can you know, do all kinds of things that are visible and out there on the web that you can't always do or that's harder to see um, in the academic conversation that happens in journals. Um, so let me start with the connections. And what I think is really important and why I think connections are important um, are this feedback um, principle. So um, you want to help your students you know, create connections to other people, get them out there thinking about research, doing research, um, and kind of create an informal peer review system for them. So what I think we do now is this. We have the feedback tunnel, right? The student hands in the paper down the tunnel to the faculty member. They write notes on it. They give it a grade. They pass it back down the tunnel. There's no you know, going anywhere else. You don't get feedback from the other students. You don't get feedback from somebody outside the class. You're just stuck in this tunnel going back and forth. And what I think we need to create is a feedback network. Um, so. We need to get, somehow get students connected to their classmates, connected to um, other people outside the class, connected to important research, um, and make that very visible. And we need to find a way to build this into the class rather than having, I mean, students do this. I mean, there are a couple of students here. I'm sure they give their papers on occasion to their friends and family members to read over. So they create this by themselves anyway. But wouldn't it be great if we just built it into the class? So, class blog. On every single post, there's an opportunity for anyone, a 
faculty member, a classmate, someone from outside the class to leave a comment and provide very, very direct feedback. Um, so let me show you. This is a comment from one of our students, and I will read it to you. Um, in my class this semester, I'm teaching a class on gender and technology, and so she says, whereas with ordinary papers that are just turned in and returned with illegible notes, um, like doctor's notes, this gives you the chance to enter in a discussion about your paper with your advisor or any others who took the liberty to read it, and this being the class blog. In the past, I've felt that making appointments with my professors to continue conversing about a paper has been tedious. This blog allows for a simple and easy effect and effective means of diving further into your paper with the e-help of your audience. So the tunnel thing was not working for her, and now having her papers posted to a blog and getting feedback from everybody in the class has been a really good thing. So one of the lessons that um, my students have learned over the years, and actually this site is down, so I'm going to have to describe it to you. Um, this is from my class a few years ago in 2005, um, and they've learned about actually what makes a good source. So that's one of the feedback um, elements that they get from their um, blog that they you know, get in different ways from faculty, but having someone come in and say, you know what? The source that you're citing here, I don't think it's a valid source. So what happened in this situation was the student had written about an article that appeared in Psychology Today about um, whether or not fetuses could feel pain. So, you know, obviously a touchy subject. And she claimed that she was using this article to support a pro-choice point of view. So you can see the conflict there. So um, someone from the outside the class actually came in and said, you know, you might want to think about this source. And so I was prompted to then go look up the author of this article. And it turns out that she and many of her articles, including this one that the um, student had cited, was being used by several right to life groups to, you know, support their point of view, which is fine, but not really a good thing to use for a pro-choice point of view. So that conversation never would have happened if someone from outside the class hadn't come in and said, hey, you know, check your source. Um, and I might have, of course, made the same comment in a formal paper, but we got to have that discussion before she'd even gotten to the point of turning this into a formal paper. So it was a really good lesson. And external feedback can come from a lot of different places. And everybody that I've talked to, and Cole gave a couple of examples yesterday as well, that's used some sort of public forum or public blog, um, has had the experience of having someone that they're writing about, an author or something, come in and make a comment. So I do actually have this one. So this is the blog of um, a student in Jason Mattel's film studies class at Middlebury College. And they wrote an analysis, not a required analysis, they just decided to go for the heck of it, watch a documentary film, and blog about it. The filmmaker came in and commented and said, thank you for your analysis. It was really good. I think you got what I was trying to do. So then the student says, oh, yay, <laughs> you know, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and by the way, I'm interested in becoming a documentary filmmaker. So the filmmaker says, email me. I'll let you work on my next project. So that was fabulous. You know, they, they got feedback, you know, on their analysis, and now they have a job. Um, and I can't show you this one. I don't think it's working. Oh, yay. So uh, this was down a minute ago. This is an archive of my course from 2005. It's not on the best of servers, so it, it's a little flaky at times. And it also has no style to it. But this was... Um, from 2005, and um, one of our alums actually wrote an article in Newsweek about how much having um, an all-women's education, single-sex education, had benefited her in her life. So one of our students wrote just a very brief little paragraph saying, wow, this really, you know, sort of, this is, these are freshmen. So she was writing and saying, wow, this is great, you know, someone actually sort of confirming my decision to come to Bryn Mawr College. So the... Um, the, the Christine here, 
actually wrote back and said, hey, thanks for commenting on my article. I really love Bryn Mawr. And by the way, you know, if there's anything I can do for you, let me know. So that built a really important connection between the alum and the student. Something that you couldn't do if you didn't have a blog. And one final case, this is from this um, semester. So um, our course in gender and technology, the last sort of half of it, focused on the technology part of that. And we were supposed to be talking mostly about gender, but we ended up spending an awful lot of time just talking about the effects that technology today is having on our students. And so they wrote a lot of posts about this issue. I mean, there are people having, our students are having real identity crises about, you know, whether what to make public, what not to make public, whether to use their real name or their blog name on a class blog. Um, very confusing things. So this one student commented on the anxiety that someone was having and said, well, you know what? When I was applying for an internship that would involve writing for a blog, and actually a lot of them do. Um, she says this, and I've seen them. Um, I included, you know, the hyperlink for this blog in my cover letter in order to get, you know, as an easy way to show some writing samples. And it actually kicked off a conversation in the interview. And another student in the class had the same experience, that the blog had come up in her interview. So she says, you know, I definitely agree that blogging can help us out in the future, and the future is now, which I thought was really funny. Uh, yeah, <laughs> future is now. Um, so the other form of feedback that I think students get, and this is a little, um, especially at Bryn Mawr, kind of controversial, but I do it anyway, um, is this kind of indirect feedback. And I know this is a little bit blurry, but on every blog that I've ever had, I've always had a list of the students, and next to that list, you can see the number of posts that they've made. So they get a real sense of the you know, quantity and quality of their um, participation in the blog by comparing themselves to the other students in the class. And we offer lots of other opportunities besides the blog, but you know, for a lot of students, this is a great outlet. For other students, it's not, um, so we try to keep track of that. We also used to keep track of popular content. So students could see when their stuff was you know, being read by the other students in the class or people outside the class. And we had a Hall of Fame, <laughs> which was, I mean, the students actually asked for this. I mean, we thought it would be a good idea, and so we said, you know, we want to do this. And they said, yeah, this would be great. So these are the, you know, top contributors, and this is from a long time ago. But um, so it's a great way to give them some sort of indirect feedback about, I mean, and this happens in, you know, everything that we do. If you publish something and only three people read it and, or three people cite it, that's a very different thing from having 40 people cite it. So same kind of concept. So the other thing that I wanted to talk about in terms of connecting is connecting with research and researchers. So the blogs and all of that are mostly about you know, connecting students to each other because, let's face it, they're not going to be found all that easily in all those Google searches. Um, so this is how you know, researchers connect to each other, right? We're all sitting in this room together. You're listening to me talk. You'll ask me questions. This is the old way of doing things. Um, and our students are certainly not going to do this. I mean, who could afford to go to a conference anymore? Um, if we can't, students can't, right? And as I explained before, they're not going to go to the library and dig through, you know, years and years of journal articles to figure out the nature of the field. So there's this. And this is a site that I've been pointing to a lot. It's, um, how many of you know about this site, Research Blogging? It's a great site. I've started, I started subscribing to its feed oh, maybe six months or so ago, and it's really, really awesome. Um, and I'm going to show you an example in a second. But this is a site that aggregates bloggers who are writing about peer-reviewed research. And there's a way, those, those of you out there who might be faculty bloggers, there's a little tool that they offer that allows you to sort of tag your post when you're blogging about peer-reviewed research. And the great thing about it is, of course, they talk about this research, and they're usually experts in the field, and they talk about it in ways that anybody can understand. So I'm an English major. I actually really like science, but I'm not going to go to a scientific journal and read an article. I just can't understand a lot of the language. So they explain it in everyday language. And they talk about why this research might be important to you as just sort of an average, ordinary person. They also do a lot of critique of research in the same kind of everyday language. I want to show one example. 
So how many of you heard about the um, Facebook makes students have lower grades in the media? Yeah, so that was about a month ago. There was a study that came out that was being presented at a conference that said, you know, students who use Facebook more have lower grades. So this, this was the t headline of all these articles. So there's been a follow-up study. And so this post is about that follow-up study. And a lot of people, when this study first came out, said, well, we don't know the methodology of this. And the person who had done the study, it wasn't published yet. So you couldn't go see what their methodology was or, or find out anything about it because the media stuff had come out before the presentation. So this is about the follow-up study, which talks both about the earlier study, explains why it was flawed, talks about the new study and why it's better. And there's also links to the original study had a response and then another response. So you have an academic conversation, peer-reviewed articles being linked to and explained how they connected in one blog post. And there's lots of stuff like that going on on this site, which is why I really like it. So it's a great place to sort of send your students and say, you know what, here's how academics talk to each other. Here's the way this, this whole process works. And there are a number of other sites. There's the example. Um, there's the academic blog portal. Some of you know, may know about this. Anybody know about it? No. Um, this is a wiki, actually, that um, allows anybody to go in and, and list their blog with um, this site. So it's divided by discipline. So you can go and see, you know, is there somebody writing about my topic in a way that might be more understandable? And this is another one that I just found. It looks slightly less active than the other one, um, but again, divided by discipline. So an assignment you can give your students is to say, go find a blogger who's writing about the topic that you're interested in. OK. So another way that um, students can connect to each other is through collaboration. So um, I'm going to show a YouTube video here. Actually, just a very small part of it. Um, so this is a project by a, a faculty member um, at the University of New South Wales in Australia. Um, he's a computer science professor. And he has his students, he throws his notes up on a wiki, and he has his students um, build them on their own. So I'm just going to show you what he has to say about this. Can we hear it? So you need to have notes to survive in this course. So, this is a so by a I'm letting you edit my notes. Um, I just threw open all, all my lecture notes. And um, as each lecture was going, I would find my lecture notes started to get flushed out of what I was saying at that instant as people were in the lecture room with laptops. Um, Spell them on their own. So I'm just going to show you what he I broke something. OK. I think we got all the background out. Sorry about that. All right. Oh, I don't want the beginning. This is about 13, I'm only going to show about a minute. It's about 13 minutes in. I said, students, there are no notes in this course, I'm afraid. I've just got terrible bullet points that I'm lecturing off. But you yourself will need to have notes to survive in this course. So I'm letting you edit my notes. And I just threw open all my lecture notes. And as each lecture was going, I would find my lecture notes started to get fleshed out with what I was saying at that instant, as people were in the lecture room with laptops and things. Spelling mistakes would mysteriously get corrected and fixed up even before I got to the point. Sometimes people would put humorous flippant points in, <laughs> in front of what I was about to say, so this is the fear that people will muck up my notes. But in general, because I trusted the students and gave them great respect, I said, you have access to my lecture notes, you can do what you want, but they're for you. They rose to that respect. I had complete faith in them. And they did amazing things. And if someone did something silly, other students would straight away change it back rather crossly. And because, they, that, because the notes were no longer my notes. This is the thing. Who knows, whose notes were they? They were their notes. The ownership had sort of moved from me to them. That was the course notes. That guy's damaging our notes. No one, and not that it happened. No one wanted to do that. So uh, that was just an amazing thing. So suddenly now my lecture notes were really detailed. And they did include exactly what I said in the lectures. Because they were often written in the lectures by the students in the lectures. Now this gave me amazing things. Yes. All right. So I think what's um, really interesting about that is that, you know, he says, the notes are not my notes anymore. They're the students' notes. And 
that's a really important thing. It turns ownership of the whole class over to the students. It's no longer, I mean, he's running the class. He's still running the class, directing the class. But the students are creating their own class as they go along, taking ownership of that material. How many of you are familiar with Michael Wesch and his work? Some, some of you. So Michael Wesch is um, a professor at um, Kansas State. And um, if you haven't seen him talk, I highly recommend it. Um, he's way better than me. And he's done some really, really fabulous work. And actually, if you go to YouTube, you can see a million great videos that he and his students have put together. And he's done the, um, he does the same thing with his notes. He has the students create um, notes for his class using a wiki. And um, almost all of his projects and papers are also collaborative projects. And this is an image that I snagged an, um, from his blog for the class of a cl the final collaborative project of, of his students. Um, and you can sort of see here there are um, you know, different colors where different students have made contributions and made notes. And they're actually at this point having a conversation about whether to use we or you or how to like frame this um, um, paper that they're writing. So they're obviously towards the end of it, um, and they're talking about you know where they need to put citations, what's missing. So um, it's a really interesting project. So they're learning from each other in this process of you know what do we need to be thinking about when we write a paper. I mean you know you can have a meeting with a professor and get all of that, but you know wah 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 and <laughs> this way you get you know your, your peers sort of critiquing you and saying you know what when I read peer-reviewed articles in anthropology they use we so we're going to use we you know so they have that that conversation via that paper um, okay so what um, Michael Wesch has to say about this project and all of his collaborative projects is that the whole point is that his students can actually create something beyond that which any single one of us could have created. So he could have had his students do these individual projects, but they wouldn't have been as good as having all of his students do one project or groups of students doing projects. And he really considers himself part of that, that process with them. And I think that's really, really important. And like um, you know, the professor from, uh, in Australia, I mean, he, they really give ownership of the class, of the projects, of the work to the student. Um, so the students take control of that. So now I want to shift gears and become transparent. Um, and a lot of what we just talked about, I think, is um, have a lot of transparent elements to it, especially like the indirect feedback, you know, sort of student, students being able to see each other's work and learn from it. I mean, the students who are writing notes together, some of those students are learning how to take notes from that process. They're learning how to write a paper because they can see the process. So I think this is really important. They don't always know when they should question authority or when they shouldn't. So um, I had a project this uh, semester, and I was actually showing it uh, to Leslie the other day. Um, a student actually did a, a multimedia project on the Amazon situation that happened over Easter weekend. Does anybody remember this situation? So the, a bunch of um, you know, gay and lesbian books dropped off of the bestseller list. They just were gone. And so she decided to you know, explore this issue. And the way that she did it was to see what a bunch of you know, bloggers had to say about it. So when she posted her project, this was the comment that one of the students left. There's this interesting play between authority and anonymity. You've quoted the bloggers and commenters as if you were quoting an expert. But who are these Shamrockette and Verdon people? Those are the usernames of the people she quoted. We don't know. They have no credibility. Yet they are authoritative. It's a wonderful puzzle. And that's the real issue that I think they're dealing with. They're dealing with this problem of authority of person, which is what you get when you go to a peer-reviewed article, not that you're getting bad information there, versus authority of information. What do you do when you're looking at information that looks authoritative but doesn't have the person behind it? How do you deal with that? So I'm going to use Barack Obama to deal with it. I'm actually going to use his Wikipedia page. 
So um, I know I, there was a presentation I went to a couple of years ago here where someone was doing um, a project where students were editing Wikipedia pages and learning um, about the process of how these sites are put together. And it was a wonderful example. Uh, the students really learned how, you know, crackpots do come in and change their stuff. And how do you go back and, and change it again and make sure that the authoritative information rises to the top and the crackpots rise, go down to the bottom? So I just want to show a couple of things that this Barack Obama article has that your standard peer-reviewed article doesn't have. It has a revision history. You can see what changes have been made. This is a, an overview. Um, you can see what's been changed at a glance. You can tell if something's changing every five minutes, this article isn't stable. <laughs> Maybe you should back away from it for a little while. Um, discussion. This article is on probation right now, as you might imagine. Um, big red hand, stop, go away, don't edit. Um, but down at the bottom, and this is what I think is fascinating, a fact about the article. So you get, you know, this is one of my favorites. Why isn't Barack Obama's Muslim heritage on this site? Why do you, are you not talking about it? Well, here's why. Because it's not true. It's not good information. And they point to the sources. There are one, two, three, four, five different sources that these people are referred to to say this is why this information is not being included. So you can see at a glance here the, you know, what are the contentious issues about this article? Faith, race, um, all these different kinds of things. So you don't get that from a peer-reviewed article. When a student comes to an article, they don't know what the contentious issues in a field are, and there are in every field. So they can't see it at a glance. Down at the bottom is the detailed, very detailed discussion of all the different things that have changed. And look at all of this stuff. I'm still scrolling. <laughs> These are people who are legitimizing the changes that they've made. So this is why I made this change. Um, what do you think about it? And then other people come in and say, well, I think it's a bad change, and here's why. And, it's, it, and half of the discussion here, um, there's actually a really interesting discussion about what to call them. Should we call them a lecturer or a professor? So you all will appreciate that distinction. And they said, you know, every news media article that we look at says something different. One calls them professor, one calls them lecturer. And so they engage in a whole conversation about which media articles should they pay attention to, which are more credible than others. Um, it's a huge discussion. They end up going with what the University of Chicago said. So that, I thought that was a reasonable way to go. And so while... Um, and I have screenshots, just in case. You can also see, you, if you want to, you can compare versions. This is two, this is about a month apart. So you can see in detail what changed. What did that crazy person put in? Who took it out? And Wikipedia has a way of weeding out the truly crazy people. This, this is the talk page for one of the contributors to the Barack Obama article. And they are no longer allowed to edit because they kept going in and changing his race from African American to multiracial and other things. And so after three times of doing that, they said, I'm sorry, no more. You're crazy. You're out. But what's missing from this? Credentials. Who are these people? Even the good ones, who are they? We don't know. They're crazy. So we have a way of sort of figuring out what academic authority is. Um, citations is one way. What you publish in, what your peers say about you, that's you know, one way that academic authority is established. But there's also this degree that you have. So what happens is, Academic, um, you know, authority of person sometimes trumps authority of information. And that can be just as bad as the other way around. So where are we? 
What do we do now? I'm not saying that peer review is a horrible, bad thing. But I am suggesting that if you send students away, go away from the blogs, you're missing, what, 99.997% of the information that's out there? And you're teaching students that, well, while I'm in school, I'll use the library. And I'm not blaming the library either. I love libraries, I have to tell you. Love them. And libraries are doing a whole lot of really great things to make their search experience so much better. They're adding tags. They're adding Amazon-like recommendations. They're adding Google-like search. So they're trying to make their sites, and they're doing a really good job of it, more like the first stop. This is where students are going to go, the Walmart of information. But our students are not always going to be students. And if they're not using library materials when they're free, are they going to use them when it costs $35 an article or $150 an article? No. Don't think so. And with all the changes that are taking place in peer review, in scholarly publications, increasingly they're going to be faced with that mess of information. They'll have no idea what to do with it. And so the way forward, I think, is not to ignore all of that mess of information, but to deal with it and to embrace your inner moron. <laughs> and tell your students to embrace their inner morons. This is how we learn. This is how we connect to each other, and we can build something that's much bigger and better than we could create each one individually. Thank you. We've got um, time for Q&A, and we've got microphones circulating. So if you just raise your hands, we'll, we'll bring these around. Thank you, Laura. That was great. Thanks. Laura, thank you very much. Um, I was wondering, have you heard about the recent uh, scam with something like Merck? Yes. And they had like this basically what seemed like a peer review article. Yes. And it actually was not. It was yes. actually a sponsored journal. Yep. I mean, well, how does that play into this question of peer review and how we're understanding these two different networks now? I mean, right. peer review is a network in and of itself. Right. And starting to connect to this other network, thankfully. Yeah, um, yeah I think that, you know, I used to do this exercise back before the internet. And I used to make my students go, um, you know, pick a topic, then go find one source for that topic, and then don't read the source. Figure out where, where that source is published. Who's publishing that? Who funds that? Are there advertisements in that? So to kind of figure out the bias of that journal publication. And a lot of times you'll find peer-reviewed material that is sponsored by some, you know, right-wing or left-wing foundation. And so how are the articles going to be tilted? So that's been an issue that's always been out there. And, you know, having a corporate-sponsored peer-reviewed <laughs> article, I mean, how, how do you deal with that? And, and of course, there's corporate sponsorship for research, you know, sort of learn, helping students figure out that just because it's got the nice printed title at the top and, you know, so has all of the sort of surroundings of peer review doesn't mean that it doesn't have bias and that it might not be suspect. Um, originally, I had a slide in here that said, you know, challenge everything. And my husband was like, you can't challenge everything. I was like, why not? I want to challenge everything. And I think that that is, you know, a, maybe a, a slightly softer version of that is what we need to teach our students. Challenge everything, the research you read, the blog that you read, the newspaper. And, you know, when you go in with that attitude of not taking everything at face value, then you want to gather as many pieces of information as you can and sort out what you, what you think based on that. So, yeah, and that, I mean, I think that's going to happen more often as the networks start to interconnect. Exactly. Yeah, right, exactly. Over here. 
over here. All right, just, I, my, I guess my perception just totally confirms yours about peer-reviewed research. I was wondering with Wikipedia and blogs, it, it's nice you have transparency. You can actually sort of figure out what's going on and see all the information. Right. Are there any moves to try to get peer review journals and things to incorporate Wikipedia and blogs so they can actually believe them and have some faith in them? Yeah. I mean, there are, um, th and I can't remember um, who required this, but one of the science journals is actually requiring their, um, the, the, you know, when you have a, an article accepted, you have to post it on Wikipedia. And it has to go through their peer review process and then the Wikipedia process, which is probably more harsh, <laughs> I would guess. So. Good morning. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, to maybe take a slightly more extreme position and, and, and get your thoughts on it, uh, the academy is a protected place. Uh, right. We bring uh, human beings into an environment, protect them from all sorts of things, and, and try to focus them on a particular uh, developmental activity. What are your thoughts about creating a protected environment that is, in, in a sense, uh, a private cloud where we can engage in these kinds of developmental activities and, and keep that within the academy in the large sense of, uh, of our institutions working collaboratively. Right. Um, well, I don't think that's necessarily a bad idea. And I actually have, um, even though my blogs are all public, um, when I work with freshmen, I actually make them use pseudonyms. So in a way that <clears throat> makes that material more private than it would be. So their names are not connected to it. Um, and, you know, in reality, we don't get a huge number, certainly of people actually commenting on our work from outside. But there's something about the way that students believe that people will be other people, not just their classmates and not just their professor, are going to read this material that makes them take it more seriously, that makes them, you know, really think about how they present what they're writing. And we actually had this conversation in the, the very first time I did this in 2005, and, um, you know, I said, look, this is what we're going to do, and we need to have a conversation about it, talk about what that means. And, you know, they didn't really quite take that seriously until the first post, you know, happened. And then they came back, and they'd read each other's posts, and they were like, whoa, your grammar sucks. You need to fix that. You're representing Bryn Mawr here. And so they learn more quickly from that process than they would if they were enclosed in a separate space. Now, I've seen a lot of people start out in a more enclosed space and then open it up, and that's certainly a valid way to, to do that. Um, I just think it's not as, you know, it's not as vital a space when you close it off. I know a lot of people who've used, you know, Blackboard discussions or the blog feature in Blackboard, and it just hasn't generated the kind of conversation, the kind of learning that they thought it would. Um, I mean, it may take just a little more effort to do it that way than it does to do it this way. I know you're uh, talking about the the science peer review journal that was mm -hmm. actually making it so you had to put something on Wikipedia. Yeah, is that a trend that's happening with other peer review articles? Because um, I feel that like, and, and Jim Groom and I have talked about this multiple times. Like peer review art, like journals tend to be their own sort of business model that wants right. to stay protected and not open because right. there's subscriptions involved in all right. of this. Right. Um, I mean, there's certainly open access journals. You know, journals that are um, out there in the public, there's not that, there's, you know, quite a few of them, um, but a lot of them are from other countries. Um, there's not as many in the U.S., uh, maybe because we're, you know, capitalists trying to make money off of these things. Um, but I do think, and I, I've heard people, you know, talking about sort of, okay, we don't want to just throw our stuff out there, but maybe we can come up with a way of creating a peer review process and publishing platform that is open and that, you know, generates kind of a network that is more connected to itself and then has maybe some links and people are obviously able to come in. Um, but I haven't heard of a lot of people sort of, it's not, we haven't hit the tipping point of that yet, I don't think. Uh, I was just going to make a comment, uh, so I'm a folklorist, and so the Journal of American Folklore uh, sending out a message saying that they expect the revenues from the journal to drop 
right. the next year right. as libraries uh, uh, decline to uh, have the hard copy. And the encouragement from uh, the American Folklore Society is to encourage both the their members, but also the members who are teaching to have their students download them, the articles either from Project Muse or from uh, JSTOR, because in fact the, the uh, organization receives um, uh, funds back right. from both JSTOR and uh, Project Muse. Right. Uh, as part of that, um, uh, the other uh, institution or the other uh, professional organizations I belong to are also making similar uh, moves into these areas. Uh, do you, uh, you encourage your students to use uh, JSTOR and uh, uh, Project Muse? Yeah, absolutely. Um, in fact, uh, the uh, student who came in uh, with the using Amazon <laughs> said, um, maybe there's a better way to do search here. And we actually, um, I, I, I showed her Google Scholar. And I showed her how to set it up so that it links to the library, so that when she, you know, that she can start her search there. And then once she sort of figures out what the parameters need to be, what keywords she needs to use, um, and once she actually clicks over and is in the library databases, she can, you know, continue her search from there. Um, so yeah, I absolutely encourage students to use those. A lot of them don't know they exist. I mean, she didn't know they existed. She didn't know that they, she had access to journal articles. She was a senior. She was a really smart, wonderful student. I was like, whoa, that's amazing. About, Wikip about Wikipedia, uh, I help students all the time. I'm in the, I'm in the library myself. And uh, uh, I'm a big fan of bibliographies. And I keep right. telling students, you know, why should you do the work when somebody else has done it for you? Right. And people, a lot of people don't realize that Wikipedia is full of marvelous bibliographies. Right. And I was helping a student one time, and we went all these databases and couldn't find it. It was a really, really uh, complicated topic. So I thought, well, let's check Wikipedia here. And there was an extensive bibliography, and there were some wonderful journal articles that we couldn't even find in databases, right. but they're right, right there in all full text. Yeah. And I said, you know, you've got to remember this. These bibliographies are just wonderful for yeah. you. Yeah, and that's where I've seen most students go, is to the bibliography of Wikipedia. Yeah. OK, this question comes from Barbara Sahel over Twitter. <laughs> um, she asks, uh, if you see a difference between students embracing their inner moron versus colleagues or faculty, and is there the same pushback, no pushback, or dare I say it, fear? <laughs> oh boy. Um, you know, I, we've, I think it's about the same, actually. I, um, a lot of the students, and you know, so in 2005, the students were actually really excited about doing a public blog. And of course, we tried to make it as safe and comfortable an environment as, as possible. Um, so they were ready to embrace their inner moron. Um, and then the following year, uh, a lot of the hype about, you know, sexual predators online, finding you via your, your live journal, your Facebook account, had really hit the media pretty hard. So the next class, the next fall, um, those students were like, no way. I don't care if I use a pseudonym. I'm not putting my stuff out there. So they were freaked out. Um, and now, you know, this semester, um, they're much more sophisticated about the way they think about it. They, they do have some, you know, issues. They're worried about the way, I mean, even in a private environment, many of my students are freaked out about what their classmates are going to think of what they wrote. So just their classmates, you know, even if we had the whole thing closed off. So um, they worry about what they're going to say. And I think the same is true for a lot of the faculty that I know that I find out many years later have been keeping a blog about graphic novels for years. Like, why didn't you tell me about this? He said, well, I didn't want it to cloud your perception of me as a faculty member. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> are you kidding? So I think that people are doing that kind of thing out there. They are, you know, writing about graphic novels or, you know, slasher films or whatever their hobby might be. But they're not connecting that to their professional identity. And they have a real problem connecting those two things together. So there is a fear. And, um, you know, even when they're writing about their field, sometimes they're, they're afraid of getting scooped. They're afraid they're going to look stupid in front of not just their local peers, but their national peers. So I think that's a real um, 
issue. But I think people are taking baby steps, and they're really, you know, they're just taking some time to think about it before they do it, rather than just resist it altogether or, um, you know, jump in and do truly crazy things. So. Um, I, I, I have kind of a follow-up to that, um, Laura. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, in that, in that story you just told of the year when students, all of that media hype had permeated the classroom and students were coming to this with sort of an inbred fear of, right. of this activity. What, how did you, as a, a faculty member, how did you um, approach that? What kind of conversations did you try to have with them in the classroom to sort of um, break down that fear or, or pull it apart? Right. Well, I mean, one thing I said was this is required. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, but I, you know, I asked them, well, and most of them didn't do it in front of the whole class. They would come to me, you know, in my office and say, Ms. Blankenship, I'm really worried. That post that I wrote yesterday, I'm not so sure about it, and I'm afraid someone's going to, you know, say something bad about it, or... I haven't posted yet because, um, you know, my mom thinks that the weirdo down the street is going to read it and figure out where I'm going to school and, you know, do something horrible to me. Um, and I just sort of talked to them one-on-one, -on -one and I was like, well, okay, here's what you can do. You know, you can write under a pseudonym, and if what you write you like later, we can change it to your real name so you can use it in your portfolio. Um, you can be very careful about what you write. Um, you know, don't... I, had a, I, I was telling Cole um, yesterday that I have had one bad incident where a student actually posted, you know, basically for a good time call and put her email address up there. Obviously very inappropriate. And, you know, not that the fearful students are nowhere near doing anything like that. But I say, you know, you're not putting your personal information up there. If you have, you know, points of view that you think are controversial, just support them well. You know, so it's basically about making a good argument, being able to stand behind what you say, and know that I'm going to be standing behind what you say as well, and that the, your classmates and everyone else. And, you know, they, they were very tentative bloggers. <laughs> it was really interesting, the difference between, you know, 2005, 2006, and now 2009. Just incredible difference. Um, so I don't know that I allayed all their fears, but I tried to. Laura, this is a comment about um, a really small piece of one slide. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, it, it's about collaborative note taking. Uh huh. Um, I've done that, um, and I do it in a way where I assign multiple students to take notes right. that day. Right. And then they put them together, and I bring the notes back to class. And I show them, uh, we pass them out to everyone else and say, is this what you remember? And if not, fix it. Right. And then the final step is um, I collect these things over time. And so I show the group the notes from the previous time I taught the course. And I tell them, use these old notes to improve your current notes. Mm. Okay, and then I grade them, and I grade them in a very simple way. Did you improve the last time's notes? If so, you get a plus. Right. Are your notes comparable, in, in which case you get a check? And are they worse, in which case I would give them a minus? It's, they're never worse. I mean, just, just the way the, the process is structured, um, if they don't do a good job, they're usually the same. And if they are, then, you know, I'm, I'm getting what I'm wanting. And so over time, the notes have gotten better and better right. just by the way it's set up. So. And pretty soon you won't have to do any work. Is that right? Oh, no. <laughs> no. No, because... No. I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah. I, see, I, don't, I don't reveal the old notes until after we've covered the material in class. There you go. So... No, but I think that's great because you're connecting your students to the previous sets of students so they can learn from each other.
Well, if there are no other questions, I want to um, take this moment to thank Laura again, not only for her presentation today, but really to her commitment to Faculty Academy for the last three years. <laughs>